Law of karma is not eye for an eye. It is a divine law guided by a divine intelligence. Hello everyone, I am Pulkit Mathur, founder of The Spiritual Bee, a blog on Vedantic spirituality and you are watching the second of a series of videos on the topic of karma. Now if you recall, in our first video we discussed that each and every action that we perform with our body, mind and senses constitutes karma and all these actions set into motion consequences or reactions which are thrown back at us. When these reactions are good, we call them rewards and when they are bad, we call them punishment. This principle of action and reaction or cause and effect or reaping what we sow is known in Vedanta as the law of karma. Now in this video, we are going to delve a little deeper and uncover certain profound truths about the law of karma which are not commonly understood. In particular, we are going to understand the workings of the karmic action and reaction process in detail and see how the law of karma is not an eye for an eye type of revengeful justice mechanism but it is governed and guided by an underlying divine intelligence which uses the law to attain a very high spiritual goal. Now what the identity of this mysterious divine intelligence is and what is its spiritual goal, all this we shall uncover in this video. Simultaneously, we will also answer two extremely critical questions about the law of karma, namely who dispenses karmic justice and how is this justice dispensed. So this video is going to be a fairly detailed one as there is a lot of ground to cover. Now before we embark on our journey, I would like to point out that all the concepts that I am going to outline in this video actually come from the writings of four sages of Advait Vedanta, Sri Ram Sharma Acharya, Sri Aurobindo, Mother Meera and Swami Vivekanan. Now usually in my videos I try to weave in exact quotes from the gurus that I am referencing. However, in this video I am going to depart from this convention and I am going to explain the teachings of these sages in my own words using my own examples. And the reason I am doing so is because karma is a complex topic and so to explain all its nuances, I will need to simplify and break down the concepts even further. And so weaving in exact quotes will not be possible. However, wherever possible in this video, I shall point to the relevant book that I used and towards the end of this video, I shall list out all the books that I referenced. So let us begin our journey towards understanding the precise workings of karmic law and discover for ourselves how the law of karma is not a blind eye for an eye type of revengeful justice mechanism, but it is governed and guided by an underlying divine intelligence which uses the law to steer our evolution towards a very high spiritual aim. And as a first step towards attaining this goal, we will need to clarify what exactly is meant by this term blind law. So the phrase blind law denotes a purely mechanical principle which has no intelligence and therefore is unable to analyze a situation and adjust its response accordingly. Now all laws of matter which we study in science are unintelligent blind laws and we shall explore the workings of one such blind law in just a few moments. However, when it comes to the law of karma, we cannot make the same assumption that it too is a blind and unintelligently driven process whose aim is to robotically hand out punishments and rewards in an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, I steal something so another of equivalent value shall be stolen from me, I kill in this life so I too shall get killed in the next life, I give 5 rupees to charity so the universe will compensate me for this amount at a future date and so on. The karmic action reaction process is not this sort of mechanical tit for tat whose job is merely to enforce a debit credit style of accounting of deeds. Instead the workings of the law of karma are deeply complex and differ starkly from the straightforward workings of the blind and mechanical laws of science. So let us proceed to understand the profound differences between the intelligently driven karmic justice process and a purely blind scientific process such as the action-reaction law of physics. And we will do this with the help of two easy examples. Suppose as I am walking, I accidentally slam my hand against a table. Then according to the laws of physics, the table will react back upon my hand with an equal amount of force and my hand will hurt. So my action has been met with an equal reaction, an eye for an eye. In this case, the table does not care whether I slam my hand intentionally or by accident. It does not care whether I am a first time offender or routinely careless. Neither does it evaluate whether the guilty party is an adult or a child. 
the table reacts back in all instances with the same amount of force. So in the realm of unconscious, unintelligent matter, the action and reaction law of physics is a blind one. It has no capacity to judge or to evaluate the intention or motive behind my action or to weigh in other factors and adjust its response accordingly, but it punishes me just the same. However, this is not how the law of karma operates. So let us examine its vastly different and complex workings with the help of a second example. Now this example is going to be a fairly detailed one, but by the time we tunnel through it, we would have gathered significant knowledge about the manner in which the karmic justice process unfolds, who the divine intelligence is who mets out karmic justice, and what is the spiritual goal that this intelligence is driving towards. So let us dive in. Suppose I'm playing cricket and just as I swing my bat, my neighbor suddenly rounds the bend and the ball mistakenly hits him in the leg. So here the question arises, what kind of karmic reaction will my action of carelessness invite? Now in order to understand the true manner in which karmic reaction unfolds in this situation, we shall break up the entire karmic justice process into four key steps. So first and foremost what shall happen is that my action of carelessness will leave a subtle impression on my mind. This impression is called as sanskar in Sanskrit and this word sanskar when transliterated into English becomes samskara. Thus there will be a samskara or an impression of carelessness that will get deposited on my mind. It is just like when we squeeze a lemon and take out the juice. In the same way, whatever life situation we find ourselves in, we subconsciously draw out an essence, a conclusion from it and this conclusion or samskara gets stored in our mind. This process of collecting samskaras or impressions is a subconscious activity and our conscious mind is not aware of it. Thus without our knowing it, samskaras are continuously being deposited on our mind day after day because we are performing actions all the time as Lord Krishna has explained in the Gita. Now once this impression or samskara of carelessness is deposited on my mind, the second thing that will happen is that it will be presented before a divine intelligence for evaluation. But what is this divine intelligence? Is it some kind of supernatural power that resides outside of me somewhere in the sky and from there watches over all my deeds? No, it is not anything like that. In fact, this divine power resides within each and every one of us as our Atman, our soul, the constant and uninterrupted witness to all our deeds, good and bad, which at all times is privy to our innermost thoughts, feelings and intentions. So it is our own Atman, our soul, which judges our deeds and it alone decides the appropriate karmic reward or punishment to bestow in any given situation. Now once the samskara is presented before the soul, as a third step the soul evaluates and judges it. Now to carry out the whole evaluation and judgment process, the soul makes use of the instrument of the inner subconscious mind, also known as the antakaran in Sanskrit. Anta means inner and Karan means instrument. As a matter of fact, as Sri Ram Sharma Acharya has explained in his Hindi book Gehna Karmano Gati, the Vedantic Rishis have classified the human mind into two broad categories. One is the outer conscious mind, which receives sensory inputs from the outside world, which thinks and makes day-to-day -day decisions, and this is called the Bahaya Karan or outer mind. The other is the Anta Karan or the inner subconscious mind, which stores the samskaras of all lifetimes past and assists in metting out karmic justice. So as a third step, the soul uses the instrument of the antakaran to evaluate whether the samskara of carelessness deposited is a good or bad one. But what is the criterion it uses to distinguish whether a samskara is good or bad? Well, good samskaras are those that reduce our ego or sense of highness, whereas bad samskaras are those that increase our ego. Now at this point we may further ask, why is a samskara which reduces our ego or sense of I-ness classified as a good one? After all, why is it so important to lower our ego? And the answer to this question is actually extremely critical to our discussion, so let us take a small detour to address it. According to the rishis of Vedanta, the reason why our soul has gotten trapped in the endlessly turning cycle of birth and death is because it has lost sight of its true nature, its swarup as it is called in Sanskrit. Our soul has lost sight of the fact that it is actually an infinite ocean of divine consciousness which has never been born and which will never die 
and instead the soul has come to falsely identify with the mind and perishable body now the element which causes the soul to lose sight of its swarup is none other than the ego or sense of iness for this reason the whole struggle of the soul is to clear away the obstruction of the ego and break its identification with the mind and body and thus realize its true nature its swarup now in order to achieve this purpose the soul uses the karmic justice system as a tool and the manner in which it does so is best understood by recalling an analogy of swami vivekananda which we had discussed in an earlier video in that analogy swami ji had compared the mind to a lake in which the sun like soul is trying to see its reflection in this mental lake the ego can be thought of as a layer of scum that covers up the waters of the lake and as a result of this ego scum the soul cannot see its reflection clearly and therefore comes to falsely rest its identity in the mind and body now the more bad the samskaras deposited in the mind the thicker is the scum of the ego and the less able is the soul to discern its true self its swarup on the contrary the more good the samskaras collected in the mind the thinner is the ego scum and the clearer is the reflection of the soul therefore the soul uses the karmic justice process as a tool to clear away the ego by rewarding the gathering of good samskaras which reduce the ego and punishing the accumulation of bad samskaras which enhance the ego till eventually there arrives a point when the ego sense is entirely eliminated and the soul is able to see its full reflection and can realize its true nature or swarup when this happens the soul attains to samadhi or moksha freedom from the evolutionary cycle of birth and death so realizing its true self in samadhi or moksha is the profound spiritual goal that the soul is steering towards however on its own attaining to moksha is actually a very slow evolutionary process which takes place over many many lifetimes as the soul uses the karmic system of reward and punishment to gradually foster the growth of good samskaras which reduce the ego for this reason the whole focus of vedantic spirituality is on offering us tools to speed up this process so that we can attain to moksha in one or a few lifetimes itself all right so now that we know the reason why the soul is trying to reduce the ego by promoting the accumulation of good samskaras so that it can realize its true self its swarup in samadhi or moksha we can return back to a cricket example where we were discussing how as a third step my soul will evaluate whether the samskara of carelessness deposited is a good or bad one in other words did it reduce my ego or enhance it now in this case it is easy to see how the samskara of carelessness deposited is a bad one this is because the act of carelessness actually enhanced my ego as in my haste to play cricket i only cared about my own enjoyment i was a little selfish and did not take into consideration the risk that my game might pose to the safety of others therefore as a fourth and final step my soul will determine the amount of punishment to enforce which will erase the deposited bad samskara now just as a human judge does not pronounce the same punishment for all crimes but reserves life in prison only for the harshest crimes and lets off minor misdemeanors with only a warning similarly the soul does not irrationally pronounce the same punishment in all situations instead the soul weighs the severity of the bad samskara deposited by taking into account the circumstances feelings and intentions which drove the initial action and only then decides upon the magnitude and duration of punishment to enforce now depending upon the severity of the deposited bad samskara of carelessness whether it is a weak or a strong one my soul will set into motion two very different karmic punishment paths so let us examine what these two paths are and we shall start with the weak samskara case first now weak samskaras as shri ram sharma acharya has explained are those samskaras which stem from actions performed where our will and intention are not strongly involved in other words these are actions done inadvertently without intending any real harm for example it may have been that this was my first time playing cricket and so in my haste i did not factor in the pedestrian traffic thus i did not set out to willfully and intentionally injure my neighbor but it was a genuine accident so in this situation the samskara of carelessness that will get deposited on my mind will be a weak one now because the samskara of carelessness is a weak one therefore in this case my soul will pronounce no immediate punishment 
but will instead adopt a wait and watch attitude rather than seek opportunities to erase this weak negative samskara my soul will allow it to lie in the recesses of my subconscious mind and the reason the soul does so is because the divine process of karmic justice always allows room for self improvement through correction of past mistakes without providing us this leeway the karmic process would turn into a veritable dictatorship and we would live under the constant threat of immediate persecution in such an environment of perpetual fear all human development would come to a standstill no one would venture to do anything or take even the slightest risk for fear of making a mistake and inviting karmic punishment therefore whenever the samskara deposited is a weak and feeble one the soul does not met out immediate karmic punishment but gives the person room for self reformation and self correction of mistakes and if this self correction undertaken by a person is genuine then he or she can succeed in completely wiping out the original negative samskara so for example in our cricket case if after injuring my neighbor i felt genuine remorse and vowed to be more careful next time and actually stayed true to this vow by being more cautious in all my future actions then i will over time succeed in not only diminishing the initial weak samskara of carelessness but even in wiping it out completely and thus no karmic punishment would ever be necessary for me so in the case of weak negative samskaras the soul adopts a wait and watch attitude and pronounces no immediate karmic retribution but what happens if the samskara of carelessness deposited is a strong one strong samskaras as shri ram sharma acharya has pointed out result from intentional deliberate and repeated actions where our will power is deeply involved so in our cricket example suppose this was not my first time playing the game as a matter of fact i had played cricket several times before but each time i purposely chose to play at a time when my neighbors were taking their evening walk thus i knowingly and maliciously injured people but was always oblivious to their pain now with my each act of willful negligence the samskara of carelessness gets repeatedly reinforced in my mind and because i never rectify my actions this samskara does not diminish but keeps gathering strength so much so that eventually it becomes a deeply ingrained habit the same attitude of carelessness now permeates other aspects of my life as well for example i routinely end up misplacing things i'm never punctual and my work quality is always poor riddled with mistakes now this samskara of carelessness will continue gathering strength in my mind till there arises a point when my soul determines that this samskara has become too strong in other words it has ripened because there is no longer any hope of change through voluntary self reformation the moment my soul makes this determination it will set into motion a process to counter and erase this negative samskara however this does not mean that i will be punished immediately rather my soul will wait patiently for the right opportunity to arise the law of karma we must keep in mind does not work on a human time scale which is preoccupied with only the present lifetime karmic justice can and often does take many lifetimes to get worked out therefore either in this lifetime or in some other whenever the conditions are suitable my soul will draw me into one or several situations where i shall be forced to experience some form of personal suffering such as an illness a disability an accident or periods of grief etc so that through these experiences i will be able to cultivate in my mind the opposite qualities of carefulness responsibility sympathy and empathy and thus wipe out the deposited strong samskara of carelessness and self-centeredness so in the case of strong negative samskaras the soul begins to look for punishment opportunities to counter and erase the deposited bad samskara however it is not necessary that this punishment is meted out in the present lifetime itself the right circumstances for it may develop only in another lifetime all right so since this has been a rather long video let us just summarize some key takeaways the first point to note is that the workings of the law of karma are complex and the entire process of karmic justice which we outlined in steps 1 through 4 takes place subconsciously and our conscious mind is not aware of it the second thing we discovered is that the law of karma is not some kind of unthinking tit for tat robotic blind law such as the ones found in science 
Instead, it is governed and guided by an underlying divine intelligence which accurately analyzes the circumstances, feelings and intentions which drove a person's actions and only then charts out an appropriate karmic response. The third point to remember is that the divine intelligence which governs the law of karma is our own Atman, our soul, the constant and uninterrupted witness to all our actions, good and bad. It is our own Atman which judges our deeds and it alone decides the appropriate karmic reward or punishment to bestow in any given situation. In order to analyze and judge our deeds, the soul utilizes the instrument of the antakaran or the inner subconscious mind. And this leads us to our fourth takeaway, which is that the profound spiritual goal that the soul is steering our evolution towards is the realization of our true self, our swarup in samadhi or moksha. To attain this grand purpose, the soul uses the law of karma as a tool to retard the growth of bad samskaras which enhance our ego and to foster the growth of good samskaras which reduce the ego. Just as a boatman uses two oars to propel his boat forward, similarly the soul uses the oars of karmic reward and punishment to guide our boat across the ocean of life in order to arrive at the destination of moksha. Now the fifth point to note is that since the divine soul guides the law of karma, therefore the karmic response is never a revengeful eye for an eye type of petty justice. As we saw in this video, in many instances, especially in the case of actions which leave behind weak negative samskaras, the soul actually chooses to enforce no karmic punishment at all in order to give a person room for correction of mistakes. Only when our actions deposit strong negative samskaras does the soul initiate karmic punishment, but this too is not of a tit-for-tat nature. For example, suppose I kill someone out of intense hate. Then it does not imply that I too shall be murdered in my next life and thus be taught a just karmic lesson. The divine soul does not met out karmic justice in this kind of thoughtless manner. Because if I too get murdered, then the samskara of hate that I am carrying within my mind from my past life will only be fueled further as I will be filled with rage against my murderer. Adding more fuel to an already burning fire is not the aim of the law of karma. Instead, its goal is to douse the burning samskara of hate by developing within me new and higher divine qualities of tolerance, empathy, love and forgiveness. And to achieve this purpose, my soul will pull me into situations where a sustained pressure is put upon me to develop these qualities, such as during times of intense personal suffering, when one is faced with life-threatening illnesses, physical disabilities, etc., and one is left with no choice but to endure and evolve higher. And finally, we arrive at our last point about the law of karma, which has been heavily emphasized by both Sri Aurobindo and Mother Meera which is that in the most correct Vedantic sense, there is actually no such thing as karmic reward or punishment. These terms do not accurately describe the workings of the law of karma. This is because the aim of the soul is not to force us to behave properly by giving us prizes for good behavior and punishment for bad behavior like some kind of strict school teacher. Its aim is not to subdue us into obedience by making us fearful of punishment and greedy for reward. Instead, the goal of the soul is profoundly different and higher, which is to help us realize our true self, our infinite divine swarup in samadhi or moksha. And to attain this goal, the soul uses various life experiences, both positive and negative, as educational tools to clear away the deposited scum of the ego and unveil the divinity that lies hidden within each and every one of us. The soul uses the law of karma to lift us from the ordinary state of limited human consciousness to the highest state of infinite divine superconsciousness, where we can each experience for ourselves the supreme truth that we are not a body and neither are we the mind. Instead, we are the Atman, the soul, pure, infinite and immortal, which is eternally merged with God and is in fact identical with God. Now before we end, I would like to list out all the books that I reference for this video. These books are all available for free and the links to download them can be found in the YouTube cards as well as in the description box below this video. So the first book which I reference widely for making this video is Gehena Karmano Gati by Sriram Sharma Achar. 
This is a small Hindi book of about 40 pages and it is absolutely critical to furthering our understanding about how karmic justice is actually dispensed. In fact, to my knowledge, it is the only book which lays out the entire process of karmic justice which I broke down and expressed via steps 1 through 4. So if you can read Hindi, then I highly recommend this book. For those who can't read Hindi, I shall be adding more videos to our karma series referencing this book. The second source of knowledge that I tapped into were the lectures of Swami Vivekanan. These lectures are essential to developing a deeper understanding of the inner subconscious mind or the antakaran, how it works, what are its components and in discovering how the ego arises. Additionally, Swamiji has also outlined the four yogas, the Vedantic tools using which we can speed up the process of realizing our true self, our swarup in samadhi or moksha. These four yogas have been wonderfully explained by him in his books, Raj Yoga, the path of meditation, Karma Yoga, the path of selfless action, Gyan Yoga, the path of knowledge, and Bhakti Yoga, the path of love and devotion. All these books and lectures of Swamiji are collectively published by the Ramakrishna Mission under the complete works of Swami Vivekanan, volumes 1 to 9. The third source of knowledge I refer to are the answers Mother Meera gave to questions posed by disciples. Her answers on karma are scattered across the many question and answer books published by the Aurobindo Ashram. And they are absolutely crucial in dispelling many of the commonly held myths and misconceptions about the law of karma. In fact, for any given guru, question and answer books are always the easiest, best and the most interesting spiritual books to read because the disciples tend to ask questions that commonly arise in all our minds. And finally, the fourth and last source that are utilized are the writings of Sri Aurobindo on karma. These are found in his books The Life Divine and Essays in Philosophy and Yoga. Now, if you are a beginner to Vedanta and have never read Sri Aurobindo's books before, then I would suggest diving into his works only after reading the books of other God-realized gurus such as Swami Sivananda, Swami Abhedanan and Swami Vivekanan. This is because Sri Aurobindo's writings are extremely philosophical and intense. Therefore, they are best understood slowly after one has gathered some preliminary understanding of Advait Vedanta. Then one can move on to the superb depth Sri Aurobindo dives into to explain the workings of the law of karma as well as other topics. Apart from this, there are many more wonderful books to read on the law of karma such as those by Swami Sivananda and Swami Abhedanan, but here I've focused only on the ones that contributed to the making of this particular video. So happy reading and I shall see you in the next video on karma.